Welcome to Savini Land, the special effects studio of Tom Savini, whose work has chilled us and thrilled us in movies like Dawn of the Dead, Creepshow, and Friday the 13th, and many, many others. I'm John Russo, and since I write and direct movies myself, I've had the great pleasure of working with Tom on a number of projects. Tom, what are some of your favorite special effects? Um, well, I, some of them are sitting around me. Uh I get asked that question a lot, and I usually say Lizzie. Um, Lizzie's from Tales from the Dark Side. She was the, the thing in the closet in the episode called Inside the Closet. Um, she's my favorite because I never had to do a full-size mechanized creature before. This one isn't the mechanized one. This is the, the stunt double we use for lighting and all that. But uh, um, we started by sculpting Lizzie from head to toe uh, in, in uh, Roma clay. And from that, we uh, made molds to reproduce her in foam rubber. And that mold also gave us uh, the capacity from those molds to make a fiberglass armature. And it was the actual fiberglass armature that we mechanized. And once the skin goes over the mechanisms, well, you have this, uh, you have Lizzie maybe being able to move her hands. She would smile. She could blink. She could look left and right, you know. I should have said my most favorite creation is my daughter Leah over here. She's remote control. I press buttons and she moves. No, she's this is my daughter Leah. Um, but Lizzie, you know, we talked about Lizzie. Lizzie is uh, foam rubber. This one, the stunt double on the fiberglass uh, understructure. Um, but Fluffy, the the creature in the crate from Creepshow, is my other favorite, and mainly because. I had never done an articulated monster face that an actor would wear. The actor could only open the jaw, move the head left and right, and make his eyes move. And we did all the facial expressions from off camera. You're going to have to pump hard. There you go. Open your mouth, Carol, now. Ah. Okay, close, close, close. Okay. Pump there. Pump there. Pump. Okay, open your mouth a little bit, Carol. A little bit. There you go. Okay, now you got it. Wonderful. Tilt your chin down there, Carol. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, funny thing about Fluffy, uh, because Fluffy was a creature whose facial expressions we operated from off camera, the very first take in the movie, when all of us were sitting around making Fluffy operate, I handed one of the controls to George Romero, uh, the director and, and writer. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Open your mouth. Out of saliva. Okay, stop, stop. Okay. Good, good, good. Okay, good. Okay. It's funny because we were sitting there making Fluffy go through all these contortions, and after about three minutes, the assistant director came in and he said, uh, uh, George, you want to yell cut now? Because we're having so much fun that George was just making the eyebrows move and he never yelled cut. So we have like three minutes of this creature doing this stuff. But uh, that, that stuff like that happened all the time on the set. Which is from uh, Tales from the Dark Side, another episode I directed called Halloween Candy. And he's essentially the same as Fluffy. An actor wore him. Again, he only had head movement and eye movement, and he could open the jaw with his chin. Mm -hmm. And by operating these cables, right. uh, you can see Butch move. He smiles, you know, he, his, his eyebrows go up and down. And um, um, that's about the extent of his movement. Well, um, I guess I'm just lucky. I mean, I don't have to live in New York or Hollywood. They call me from New York or Hollywood, and I go where they are and, and set up a little studio there and, and work. Uh, I, tr I live here, but I do travel a lot. This year, we're lucky to do three movies right here in Pittsburgh, and we already have, sh we shot about eight movies here in Pittsburgh. Uh, Dawn of the Dead, uh, Creepshow, Monkey Shines. Uh, they even did some of RoboCop here in Pittsburgh. 
Um, but I do travel a lot. Uh, I went to Hong Kong and did a movie called, um, well, I, I think it's Till Death Do We Scare. It has some Chinese title. But in that movie, there were a lot of interesting... It was a comedy, so we had a lot of interesting, funny things that... One guy... We had to take this guy named Wong Ching, and he reaches in his mouth and makes his mouth stretch out real far to, to freak out some other guy. Camera! More, 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 more. In the finished take, the guy, we did many takes of him stretching a little bit first, because we didn't want it to tear. And then when we saw it wasn't tearing, we did a take where he stretches his mouth out real far and does this kind of move. And then eventually a bird flies out of his mouth. You know, you have to see the movie to understand what the hell is going on. Well, I imagine you can't just spring these effects on a director or bring them uh, to a day of shooting without testing them, right? Oh, impossible. I wouldn't, uh, sometimes you may have to because of a schedule, just like rush from the workshop with something that hasn't been tested. And hopefully it works on the set or the, the testing is on the set before the cameras. But normally we, we, we have to, uh, for our own good, test things uh, in our shop. Uh, well, for example, Jason. Um, I mentioned that I had to travel to Hollywood, uh, and in traveling to Hollywood was for Friday the 13th, part four. Uh, we had to kill Jason in part four, the final chapter. You know, Jason's been running around killing teenagers left and right, but in that movie, Jason gets well, you think he gets his death, but obviously there's been four more since we shot that, but we had to make just Jason uh, get hit with a machete and slide down the blade, and uh, so we had to make sure the blood would work. So we tested it with water. We tested him sliding down from different angles. We actually shot our own video that we would show to the director so he would have a palette, you know, to choose from. So we did Jason with the water coming out of his head. Um, in your movie, in, in, in The Awakening, I had to have an actor, well, you had to have an actor as the director, uh, crash through a car window. So to make the actor feel a little bit more comfortable, as you as you recall, I had people hold a piece of breakaway glass, and I actually made my head go through it. You know, so when the actor saw it, he said, "Well, if you can do it, I can do it." You know, so. And, oh, and bullet hits. We have to test bullet hits on various people. Uh, I think almost every movie that where there's a bullet hit, I would grab somebody from my crew or a friend would come to visit and say, hey, let me test this on you, you know, so. We'd pull a bullet hit on him and we'd test the, the, the squibs, you know, on his head or my assistant's head. Um. Roll south. Rolling. Please. Scene 60, Apple David, take one. Everybody settle. Okay, do it. Okay, next what? Gagging. Action, Gary. Take me. Please take me. Ready, set. One time in the burning, I had to uh, set myself on fire. Uh, this, I mean, the stuntman came in, he did a wonderful uh, fire gag, but when he was gone, and he was being paid quite a fee, I said, look, you know, I can do this. Uh, when it comes to my legs, you know, don't use the stuntman, I can set my own legs on fire. I set my own legs on fire, or I set my hand on fire, you know. Um, we test uh, constantly. I'm trying to recall, let's see, bullet hits we test, the fire gag we tested, the glass we tested. Uh. Okay, here we go. Okay, 
Market? Any market? I can't see. Yeah, it's market. Go ahead. Okay, right. Georgia. Let's go. And action! How about the, the, the roaches in uh -huh. the creep show? Well, now, you, now you've hit it. Uh, that, to me, was the worst worst testing because I can't stand bugs. Um, bugs, spiders, and here's roaches. Here's 28,000 roaches, and I had to make, um, I had to do the scene where thousands of roaches are coming out of E.G. Marshall's mouth and his chest, and uh, I personally didn't ever, I never wanted to be in the same room with those things. So, for the test, we were in the bathroom somewhere with a, with a facsimile of E.G. Marshall and, and a syringe, and the entomologists weren't there, so I had my 17-year-old assistant fill up this syringe that was fastened behind E.G. Marshall's mouth with roaches, and when they were finished, when they were loaded, he called me in, and I remember coming in and putting my hand on E.G. Marshall's, I don't know why I did this, on E.G. Marshall's mouth, because there was a trap door in front of the syringe where the roaches were contained, and I didn't know this, but the trap door was gone, and so I'm looking at E.G. Marshall, and I'm testing, and then these roaches came between my fingers, and my recollection is seeing the roaches and all of a sudden, I remember being on the other side of the bathroom. I don't remember jumping up and running, but I just remember being there, because that's how bad they scared me. So it also taught us that by pumping blood into the tips of these syringes, the roaches, when they passed through, would be covered with blood. So they, we saw in the test that these roaches left little roach footprints across E.G. Marshall. And um, let's see, the, well, in the same movie with the uh, uh, creep show, um, we had... Um, the specter that appears in the window at the beginning of the film. It's a, it's a skeletal thing that's floating in the air and his clothing is waving around and he, he looks at the kid and he beckons him to look at the garbage can. Well, that, that's a real skeleton from Carolina Biological Supplies that uh, my assistant and I mechanized. And um, we had to test. Now, that's an example where he is soaking wet with paint. We never tested them, and on the set, we had to test them. So there's George with the camera, and like, there's six people behind operating different, different mechanisms. George is talking, I'm talking and about, well, make his eyes move left to right a bit more, or raise his chin, or move his hand over there. So there's six people back there, and I'm sitting there with a remote control box, and all I did was make his eyes move left, left and right. But I'm also kind of verbally choreographing on camera the test for Raul, and it worked great because George got a lot of footage that he could extract from, you know, for using, what, five or six seconds in the movie, you know. In Day of the Dead, we had, um, we cast my body. The very first zombie that you see in Day of the Dead is a guy who's, who's walking. You see his shadow on the ground, and then I think the camera pans up and you see this zombie lumbering in with the sun behind him. And when he walks into the light, you see that half of his face is blown away. His tongue is dangling out. Well, it's actually me a facsimile of my body with gray hair and a, a decayed makeup and we had to construct this fiberglass and latex replica of me and it's a combination of the puppet being held up in the air the puppeteer's hands being the puppet's hands and the puppeteer is actually walking on his knees holding this thing up and we had to test we were testing i think we were testing the eyebrow movement the eyes left and right and the jaw opening and closing with this tongue hanging out. And that, but fortunately for us, we could test this in our workshop in Pittsburgh before we flew this whole thing to Florida, which is where they shot the, uh, the actual scene. And uh, we actually, we took the nickname from SCTV, it had Dr. Tongue's World of 3D, you know, so we named it Dr. Tongue because we love SCTV and, you know, in combination of the tongue hanging out, you know. I mean, w these nicknames for these things just pop up, like Lizzie, a policeman walked into my house one day, a friend of mine, he says, hey, Lizzie, it stuck. Nick Mustandry on the set of Creep Show said uh, uh, to, the, to this ugly, hideous monster, oh, pretty fluffy, fluffy stuck. Looking around at all these marvelous creations, it, it seems like the, the opportunity for, for just practical jokes and oh. having fun would be <laughs> endless. It is. In fact, uh, we might make something and it, it, it makes us want to, to test it, maybe scare somebody on the street or something. Well, George Romero was doing it when he was a kid, throwing dummies in flames. I don't know if he wants people to know this, but he said, I think he threw a dummy in flames off a roof in New York City. I think he went to jail, or his father threatened to call the police or something. Uh, I remember when I moved back to Pittsburgh from North Carolina, 
uh, right after the army, I, I had uh, fake hands and things. I just gave one to the next door neighbor's kid. I didn't know this, but he was putting it in the snow outside of his house and putting ketchup around it and sitting in his window and just watching people come by. And, you know, f I didn't know he was doing it. He told me about it later, but uh, then we did the same thing. Uh, I had uh, in Texas Chainsaw, we had a severed hand. And I put it in. I put my own hand into a box and put a severed wrist appliance on it and dripped some blood. So I remember walking around the office uh, with this box in my arms in Texas, just waiting for somebody to ask me what's in the box so I could open it and show this this severed hand. And they would go ooh. Then I make my hand move and it would really freak them out, you know. So. Boxer hand. Neat. Just get cut off or something. Wow. Chris, look. Wow, that's cool. What is that, a mechanical hand? Must be. Yes. How'd you guys do that? Hey. How'd you guys do that? Well, put my Tom, say hi to your public. Hi, public. <laughs> or sometimes I'll be, I'll be lying in my bed, uh, minding my own business, watching TV, and I'll hear the neighborhood kids playing outside. Remember, I quickly had this urge to scare them, so I grabbed the fluffy puppet from Creepshow, and I, I'm only in my underwear now, and I jumped in my backyard, I climbed the fence, and I, I ran down the alley quietly now, moved things out of the way, and I waited for a, a lull in their conversation, and I made Fluffy come out and go, and I remember every kid tried to be someplace else at the same time, they were running into each other, and that's this, I mean, it, it wasn't a movie we were shooting, but it was a thrill, knowing that this thing was scary, you know, so. And plus, it was an outlet for our practical jokes. Uh, what about Grandpa? Wasn't there a practical joke involving him in Texas? Oh, well, when we did this Grandpa makeup on this young guy, he was like 35 years old, and uh, uh, after we had him in makeup for the first time, we were driving him to the, to the location to show Toby Hooper, the director, and we thought, let's put a tin cup in his hand and have him stand on the street or something and see what happens. But we didn't do that, but we did have him go and sit into, in a diner, in a restaurant, and people really thought, oh my, this poor old guy, you know. And so our thrill was watching people look at him. One, it was a practical joke, and two, it was a test of how realistic the makeup was, you know. So we're doing that all the time. I mean, practical jokes. Every time we make something, there's an outlet for a joke involved in it, you know. <laughs> we break the tension uh, all day long, any chance we get. The, the fun, it is fun creating the stuff, you know. The fun is inventing how to do the effects. But as the day wears on and, you know, you're, you got a deadline, um, I remember uh, John Vulich and Everett Burrell, two guys that were working on this film, uh, I think John put a spaceman suit on and Everett put a gorilla suit on and they would go knocking on office doors just to freak out the secretaries and it wound up to be a wrestling match on the floor and it was hilarious. But that's how we break tension or we have music playing all the time. Um, even though it's an eight-hour day, I might let them have an, like a two-hour lunch and go buy magazines, because, you know, we come here in the, when it's dark in the daytime, we leave when it's dark, we're missing a lot of daylight. Our, like, our whole, our whole summer seems to just zip by when we're preparing for a film. Um, and right now you're uh, preparing for one film and maybe even two. Well, it's two films in one. Um, George Romero was directing... It's two movies in one, like Creepshow was four movies, five movies in one. Dario Argento is directing his segment, and George Romero is directing uh, his segment, and, but we're working like it's one movie and doing all the effects on that. Well, like uh, some lunch day, we might go and ride on my boat, like on the river, just take a nice relaxing boat ride in the sun. You come back and the crew is you know, refreshed, you know, and it makes them work even better, you know, when there's some outlet for, for their, um, what do you want, their, um, their imagination, you know. And sometimes um, just to for a, for a pause in a, in a long 18-hour day of um, we might let somebody work on a little personal thing of their own like somebody might be making a, 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 or a sculpture of Frankenstein or something so so if they're working on that uh, I know they're not gonna be working that all day but uh, let them work on that for a couple of minutes and then they they feel better by jumping on to doing somebody else's stuff you know my own self between films um, I, uh, I'm sculpting a bust of my father or I did a, uh, I, had an idea, I had this wrought iron gate in front of my house, and I thought, gee, it looks kind of, it's pretty, but it's kind of barren, so I sculpted a gargoyle kind of a thing, you know, like a demon head, and uh, I actually used the pattern on the gate, and I, so I sculpted the demon to fit the pattern, and then I cast it in fiberglass, and now it's sitting on my gate at home. Or I, was, I had a life mask, uh, a life cast of myself, I thought, you know, I've always wanted a Phantom of the Opera face for myself, so I sculpted my face, 
into uh, Lon Chaney's face and then stretched that into the Phantom of the Opera. And I sculpted it in clay and made the plaster molds, and now that's sitting on my, uh, my bookcase at home. Um, a perfect example, uh, I was doing monkey shines. And monkey shines, uh, my attitude is I panic first until my shelves start filling up with the effects that are required in the film. And when that happens, it's easier for us schedule-wise toward the end of the shooting schedule, instead of rushing to get things ready. Everything is done and on the shelves. Now we have time to play. So Halloween came up and uh, Everett Burrell um, and myself decided to make myself, make me into this demon from my Halloween makeup. So um, I sculpted the horns, Everett did the makeup, and Everett actually applied it. And uh, we, we walked around the sets on Monkey Shines shooting video of me in this demon makeup. And now I got this beautiful poster of myself in this demon makeup. The actual DP, the director of photography on Monkey Shines, so let, oh, let me photograph it. I, I have to photograph it. He did this nice red light and smoke, you know. Now, instead of having Polaroids in the makeup, I got this wonderful. Uh, uh, beautifully composed and shot uh, picture of myself as the demon, you know, which I now have a poster of, you know. Remember the machete you made? I think it was used in Friday the 13th and maybe uh, Dawn of the Dead, and then we got to use it in Midnight, so the thing got three uses. Yeah, yeah. I like to use the real actor as much as possible, so we just devised a fake knife that when, it look, when it's against somebody's neck, it looks like it's cutting through. <laughs> <laughs> Please, let me go. In another time we had to test, um, we had no idea how we were going to do it, but we, had, we knew we had to make, in Monkey Shines, we, uh, we were thinking about tr making a monkey look like it could jump on people. So we fastened, uh, we made a, a, a foam rubber monkey with a soft foam for the body and a heavier foam for the hands so you would get the weight in the hands and the feet. And we dangled him from a string on a fishing pole or a bamboo pole or something just to see if we could make him look like he could jump on. We used crew members and made him jump on different crew members. You know what we should do if we're going to do it this way is it's got to be done from behind. You know, so it's like actually propelled instead of an arm. You know what I mean? Yeah. All right, do that again, Ev. That looked good. Excellent, excellent. I'll make you crazy, but... Yeah. Monkey ball. That looked neat because it looked like you could jump on the wall. And, and when that worked, I was excited about going to George and, and showing him how it worked. But now George was in an office around the corner. So as I was walking down the hallway, I realized if I, I could make the monkey perhaps jump around the corner and land on his desk. And the first time I did it, it worked. I had a, made the monkey on the pole, and I, I flipped him around the office, and George was sitting there minding his own business, and this monkey jumped on his desk, and we knew that it could work. And another time, we had this, uh, this mechanical monkey that we named uh, RoboChimp. This is RoboChimp right here. Now, RoboChimp could... Um, you know, he could open his mouth and uh, make his head move left and right. And this was mainly for when an actor in the film would be talking to a monkey. You know, as long as the monkey's head could move up and down, and I'm talking to it. See, the real monkeys wouldn't stitch still for anything, you know. So as long as he was doing this and out of focus, and you're focused on me, the impression is that we're talking to this monkey. So when we made RoboChimp, we shot extensive video of him working, and one day we walked into the producer's office to show George who was in a long conversation with the producers, and we were just setting up the TV. And when RoboChimp appeared on the screen, the producer who was talking looked, and it, all he thought he saw was the real monkey. So I said, hi, I like our fake monkey. And he went, what? He could not believe it was the fake monkey. So then we knew we were, it was going to work, you know. So RoboChimp became a success that very day through testing. Well, in uh, The Awakening, which is now called Heartstopper, you uh, did a number of of effects for bullet hits, and uh, Kevin Kinlan had, had uh, got it in the head and the chest and so on. Well, that was an opportunity for us to use a new technique for bullet hits that um, I read about it in Dick Smith's correspondence course, and he mentions that they used it in Heaven's Gate, 
where they were actually able to do bullet hits in people's faces, as in Kevin Kindlin's case, with the bullet hit in the head. We put an explosive, uh, uh, this plate that was made from his life cast, on Kevin, we glued it on Kevin, and then we put the explosive charge on his forehead, okay? A thin foam latex appliance went over that, and we even were able to make a life cast that included the metal, the, the, the tubing that pumped the blood to that area. This would be the outline of the metal, metal plate where the explosive charge would be. So then the rubber appliance that we made from this mold had all this on the underside of it, so it fit the actor who was wearing all this stuff exactly the way it fit the actual mold. So then we pressed the button and the, explos the explosion would, would happen right on his head. Even from the side, it would be a very thin piece. The explosion would, would burst out of that metal plate and then we simply pumped blood, blood into it as you can see in the film. Of course, in the movie, you played uh, the role of Vargo, a cop who's trying to hunt this vampire down. You finally get him on the bridge, and that's where the, where the bullet goes to the head. Mm -hmm. But the action that led up to this was tremendous, and, and you also choreographed that, that sequence. Oh, thanks. But um, I'm lucky that um, um, I feel the more you do, the more you get to do. And uh, there's a guy working for me named Greg Funk, who is also a stuntman. So in your movie Heartstopper, there's a scene where Greg runs across the street and is smacked by the car. I was able to use Greg in the staging of that fight. Every time uh, I had to like kick or a side kick onto the vampire, it was Greg Funk. Uh, when the vampire is escaping the room and jumps out the window, it's actually Greg Funk wearing a mask of Kevin Kinlan, the actor. So if you decided to shoot that in slow motion and his hands move away in the stunt, it looks just like, you know, uh, Kevin, which is cool. Come on. Up here. Uh, here's somebody that found, found her way into one of our movies. In fact, oh, that's right. Heartstopper. That's right. Leah plays uh, in a flashback scene with her little pigtails. Um, because the character I play, Vargo, lost his daughter when he was younger, and we did this wonderful, you, you staged this wonderful scene of Leah. I remember having to bribe her with candy, though. She wouldn't do the scene unless she knew I had candy in my pocket, right? Remember that?
You've been down here for hours. When are you going to quit? You gotta stay in shape to go after the bad guys. Baby, come to bed. I want to get pregnant again. I know another child won't take Kathy's place, but it would give us somebody to live for besides ourselves. You gotta be crazy to even think about bringing another child into this world. You, do, you ran to daddy and it was very sad. Remember we watched it and we got a little misty on there. I anyway, you want to say goodbye to everybody? Bye. Say thanks for coming and goodbye. Say, uh, Leah, tell them uh, uh, come back to Savini Land again sometime. Uh, how about okay, thanks, you know. thanks for coming to Savini Land. Thanks for coming to Savini Land. But do it without covering your face, okay? There you go. Well, say goodbye to everybody. Thanks for coming to Savini Land. Thanks for coming to Savini Land. Bye, everybody. Bye, Bye everybody. everybody. <laughs> <laughs> My daughter, listen. Watch. Should I scream? Wait, wait. Okay. Down with the tears, Will. Down with the tears. Down a bit more. There. Okay? Quiet, please. Come on. Give me the snake. Will you start screaming from our chest? Right. The camera's not rolling. Don't plug in. There. Hold it there now. Camera's coming when you're ready. Turn over. Both cameras rolling. An expression. That's it. Are you ready to go? Scream. Down, down, down. Action top. Uh, uh, Talk to uh, Wait, it's all coming out the inside. Okay. Okay. Uh, down, 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 Put your hand up, girl, just so I can see it in the frame. Girl, lift your hand up so I can see it, that's all. Yeah. The other one, give me the back of your hand, that's right. Lately, it's still now. I saw someone in the air. In the neck. Still breathing, though. Seeing 70 Baker take one. Target. Okay, Here we go. Flash. Go. Go. Go.
famous, infamous Tom Savini steps. Look at that, he's even working out to what a guy. And you couldn't even do one of these. <laughs> Thank you.